move days, but be doing Nerd Cave Retro before open micers. It just it feels wrong. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm curious as to how my show is going to go, because like I've like I did the Facebook live stuff, but I haven't done it to the extent that I'm going to do starting tonight. So I've been like practicing, you know, like memorizing where the hot keys are to, yeah. you know, play the music in the proper spots and everything. So and you're, you're going to Twitch live, right? YouTube. Oh, YouTube. OK. I have gained a few new subscribers over the last few days, so that's... Dude, our numbers have been bad. going up significantly on this show the past few weeks just from putting up those little, you know, audio things that I put up, those little audiograms and just doing the posting and all that stuff, so... Yeah, I think it's it's just reminding people that the We're show here. is there instead of just, you know, posting, oh, here's the episode. Yeah, I've been posting a lot to uh, the retro gaming uh, community on Twitter, like those communities are actually great for uh, for for notifying people of things. Oh, good, good. Especially like the horror community and all that kind of stuff. Like, dude, they those people are active as hell, and the retro gaming ones are great too. Yeah, I need to. Uh, I feel like I need to get more engaged on social media. It's just like. There's only so many hours in the day. Oh, I know. Trust me, I know. Uh, let me share this to Facebook. Oh, I also have a funny rage quit story for the game I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. I almost raged quit on the big game that I'm doing for uh, for the show that we got paid for. <laughs> I can see why. Yeah, there was a spot I literally got stuck and did not know what to do. I actually called uh, our mutual friend of the show, Tyler Watson, <laughs> at like 11 o'clock at night. I was like, dude, I am literally <laughs> don't know what to do here. Like, I'm stuck, and I, I, I don't know what to do. You're like, help me. <laughs> help me. I, I, I almost rage quit. Like, it was bad. Yeah, I, I'll i tell more details whenever I get into the review, but I got so pissed to the point that I threw my uh, 3DS across the couch. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen you mad before. <laughs> I I used to have a pretty bad temper, but I've like it's <laughs> it's not good for my health to yeah. get like that mad anymore. So I I've really worked on like trying to be like eh, it's end of the day it's no big deal until you get to be my age and you just get mad at everything for no reason whatsoever you're just angry I'll probably, all the time i'll probably get to that point <laughs> uh, uh, let's see i think so you added another story in yeah, there i saw I so. one more in here and uh armez right, jackson me... sent to us a little little while ago the great armez jackson yeah but if this last one if we're running out of time and we don't think we can get to it we can skip it for next time because it's not a it's not a time sensitive I, news story yeah i I, don't know, I think it would be a fun discussion i mean we can always cut like two of the gaming history segments too okay yeah because so, it's I'll, all good i don't want to go past like seven ten because i still gotta do open mic yeah seven thirty. So. yeah and i i want to do some more tests and run throughs with my with my show before i start okay yeah, I'm right. ready when you are. I've got everything up. Let me oh, widen this box a little bit. The camera here. looks crooked. Ah, now you're straight. I was wondering why everything was looking kind of wonky. I was like, eh. yeah, it was my camera. Okay. All right. Well, I'm good to go if you are. Yep, I'm all set. All right, here we go in three, two, one. programs we are back for another edition of the nerd cave retro show my name is jason robbins and my name is derek diamond we're on a new night we're on monday nights 
from now on. Yeah, I, we were just talking off air. It, it feels weird because I can see the light coming in from your window. Yeah. There's light coming in from my window that's to my left. It feels weird doing a podcast during the daytime. I know. It flip flop the shows around. It feels it feels wrong to do not Nerd Cave Retro before open micers. I'm sure we'll get used to it. I, I think in the long term this will be this will be a good move for our uh, our Disney Channel esque yeah. <laughs> uh, block of shows. And hopefully we'll start regaining some of the people that we lost when we moved nights to a later time slot because people weren't able to join us. So now that now we are back uh, on Mondays at 6 p.m. We are live to Twitch, my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash jfunktastic. Uh, 6 p.m. Central, we will be live from now on. So if you want to watch the show live, we will be here. And uh, have a link tree set up um, in our, every single one of our... Um, uh, social media sites now so if you ever need to know where we're at what we're doing just go click that link tree and it will take you to everything we're doing link tree is such a great invention oh, I, I made so one great. for for my show too and it's just great to have a a central hub where you can just you know because even you know i made some business cards and i put a qr code on it yeah. to you know for people to scan it and it just takes you to the link tree because i'll tell people Everything you want is there, where the show can be mm -hmm. downloaded, subscribed to, the social media, all that. I love it. So I spent the last few days making that a nice little link tree and putting everything I can think of on there. So if you've ever wondered, like, what time does this happen? Where does this, where do I need to go for this? What, where are they at here? Just go to the link tree and that'll take you to everything. Yeah, no, it, it's, uh, I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be good, like I said, in the long term. And, and funny enough, for those that you know are longtime listeners of the show, when we started the show, it dropped on Mondays. Because mm -hmm. we, uh, I remember we used to record it Sunday night before yeah. we started doing the show live. And then the show would be posted Monday morning. So nice. Uh, everything's come full circle. Yeah, so we're back on Monday evening. So if you'd like to join us live, hopefully that's a better time slot for everybody. And uh, we got a little news to get to this evening. Would you like to jump into it? Let's do it. Here we go. Today's stories were submitted to us by Armez Jackson and Donner, Party of Five. If you have a story you'd like us to cover, send them to nerdcaveretro at gmail.com. And the first story tonight comes from nintendolife.com. Uh, something I want to talk a little bit about last week, didn't get really get, get to, uh, but we did bring it up. Uh, lawsuit brought against game grading firm WADA alleging market manipulation. In August last year, WADA generated plenty of headlines as criticism started to mount over the broom of retro game prices amid allegations of wrongdoing from the game grading firm. Claims surfaced alleging the company was artificially driving high prices, along with claims of collusion with auction house Heritage Auctions, this extensive, well, there's an, a video in the, in the, uh, uh, the, the article here uh, by Carl Jobst, um, brought, he was the one that brought the allegations to a wide audience. Uh, there's now a class action lawsuit that was initiated this week in the Central District uh, Court of California, and it says, uh, Heritage Auctions benefited by earning more commissions from sellers and buyers. Um, Halperin benefited from the value of his game game increasing, uh, and Halperin is the guy that runs WADA. I don't know if I said that. WADA benefited by the increased notoriety and incre increased demand for grading services. Also, the increased value of games allowed WADA to charge even more for its grading services since prices were, were tied to values. Yet the relationship between WADA and Heritage Auctions was still unknown to collectors. Meanwhile, video game collectors rushed to send in their own sealed games to water for grading, believing they could sell the games for profits as the market soared. Unbeknownst to collectors, WADA was massively bogged down by the rush. Still, the company advertised false and overly optimistic turnaround times on its website. Customers were not notified of the delays in advance of their purchases. WADA continued accepting orders and payments from customers. So that's the big, one of the big things that this website is saying that not only were they manipulating uh, basically insider trading and driving these prices up artificially. They were also getting bogged down with the amount of people wanting to have their stuff graded and they weren't able to meet those, what they promised because they have those tiers. I don't know if you've ever been to WADA 
to uh, see if you could, um, if you ever wanted to have a game graded, you could do the regular, which says, you know, this could take it uh, up to, you know, six weeks to, to get graded and returned. And then you have like, you pay even more and you can get it back in like, you know, within a week or whatever. And there's like three or four different tiers that you can you pay for on WADA to have your stuff done quicker. But they weren't doing that and they weren't telling people and people were, you know, paying the high price to have their stuff back in like, you know, 72 hours or whatever. And they weren't getting their stuff back for weeks, even months. And that's a big no-no. I was about to say in in layman's terms, that ain't great. Nope, it's not. No, and we've been saying this for a while now, you know, and, and going back to talking about how these games have been going for just astronomical prices and just thinking why and how is this happening? And it's, you know, I mentioned the show coming full circle. I feel like this story is coming full circle now that this has come to light. And also they, they weren't putting out um, the, the numbers of the amount of games that they had, like they, like the, uh, the super Mario 64 that went for like a million and a half dollars, but they have, and they put out, I forget exactly what it's called, but it's the amount of though, like these certain graded games that they have on hand. And there were like hundreds of them and they made it sound like they, there was one or just a couple because they were hiding these numbers from people. How have they been able to get away with this? I don't know what they were thinking. Like, you're not going to get away with this for long. Eventually, this is going to catch up with you, and it has. We we live in a day and age now where you like, you can't really get away with anything because information is just so easily accessible. Something eventually is going to leak. And let's be honest, karma gets everybody yep. at some point. It might be... A day, it might be a week, it might be years, <laughs> but but Lady Karma always comes around to collect. Yep, I've been waiting to see when this was going to happen because I knew it was coming. Yep, and here it is. It's here. They're they're getting their their d- just desserts. I can't wait to hear more about this. I, I'm sure, probably even as soon as next week, we might know more. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure that this is this is going to be something we're going to be covering every week for for the next few months, probably. Oh, for sure. It'll be like our version of the the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's see. Our next story comes to us from bleedingcool.com. I haven't looked at this website in forever. I know. Uh, Evercade announces two new arcade collections for Jalico and Galco. Hopefully I'm pronouncing those correctly. Uh, Evercade has revealed two new retro game collections. Uh, Jaleo Arcade 1 will feature eight arcade titles from the Japanese publisher, while Galco Arcade 2 will bring out six more games developed in Spain. Uh, you can read more about both titles below. Uh, Jail- Jailico Arcade 1 uh, is one of Japan's most famous game publishers when it comes to international recognition, especially in the U.S., where it operated a local office until 1993. Uh, I'm trying to see if there... It doesn't seem there's a list of the actual individual games Yeah, i don't think they have the individual games it just kind of tells you about each one uh let's see because jalico if if people remember jalico made stuff like astyanax and then they did uh bases loaded you know all the bases loaded games they were pretty big in the uh, nintendo and super nintendo era but it does not say here what games are going to come on these collections um, and the Gale It's coming Co. out in July. I don't remember Gale Co. It's G A E L C O. I that must be the yeah. I think this is the Spanish version of Jalico. So that's yeah. It says confusing. here the, the Spanish arcade grade is back with even more fun titles, many of which will see their first ever release outside of an arcade in this collection. That's pretty cool because I mean, you know, we talked last week about the Simpsons arcade game as an example that. Yeah. was never really released to a console or worldwide audience. But Jalico had some really good titles back in the day. I'm kind of interested to see what's going to come on this uh, this arcade um, bundle that they're going to have. Yeah, me too. I, I'm as I've mentioned in the past, I've 
not been a huge like arcade goer because of you know none really being around me but it, this sounds like it'd be a pretty cool collection i think so i hope so be nice yeah hopefully so uh let's see for the next story it's from nintendolife.com indie horror dev launches kickstarter to create a game for pokemon mini um the micro console my uh Pokemon Mini launched in 2001 in Japan and North America right before the GameCube came out and the following year in Europe. came in three colors, had ten games released for it. Only four made it to America um, with an additional game going to Europe. And it's still the smallest cartridge-based system Nintendo has ever made. Um, despite its short run and tiny library, fans figured out a way to reverse engineer the tiny little system years ago. And many have been making homebrew games for the system. But one indie developer is taking it a step further and wants to create a brand new entry in its horror series for the miniature system. Uh, Sun Grand Studio uh, has been making games on old hardware. The developer of the Silver Fall series is currently making seven new games for both the 3DS and the Wii U. I think we talked about them a few weeks ago. Um, with one mm -hmm. game even getting balance board support. After announce announcing these seven new entries, many fans asked for more ports or new games in the indie horror franchise could be made for older consoles and trust some dedicated fans to ask for new Silver Falls game on the oft-forgotten Pokemon Mini. They listened and have launched a Kickstarter to make this dream a reality. You're getting a new... If you are... I don't know anybody that has this thing, but I imagine somebody like Tyler Watson <laughs> might have something like this, uh, which if he does... You got a new game coming. I have not thought of the Pokemon Mini since, since it initially <laughs> came out. My question would be, and I don't want to downplay them doing this. I think it's really cool. Out of all the older consoles and systems that you could make a new game for, why, why the Pokemon Mini? I, it, it looks like it sounds cool. I think it's a really cool thing, but... Why the Pokemon Mini? Because <laughs> it's hipster. I don't know. <laughs> I, I guess. I, I don't know. Like, I haven't thought of the Pokemon Mini since 2001. I never owned one, so I I can't comment on whether or not they were any good. Uh, I'll be I honest. I knew of them. When I saw this article, this is the first I've ever heard of it. I'm not surprised because I don't remember them really being, like, marketed very well. Yeah. Like, I remember seeing one in a store, and I'm like, oh, that's cool, but never got one. How tiny is this thing? I mean, I see a picture of it, but it doesn't really have anything to, for scale. Do you know how big uh, this thing was? I can't. I can't remember. Let me look. Let me see if I can find a picture, like in somebody's hand. Let's see. Pokemon Mini. Da da da. I was not expecting to talk about Pokemon Mini on yeah. the show tonight. Apparently, they made a new game for an old Nokia flip phone as well. <laughs> Now, that sounds like a hipster thing to do. Yeah. Okay, so the Pokemon Mini, it looks to be about the size of two, maybe two and a half Game Boy Advance cartridges, which is not not very big. Hmm. So, like, it would probably even be small for me, and I have small hands. See, so. I'm thinking, like, looking at this, I'm like, is this, like, the size of, like, a Tamagotchi or something like that? Yeah, I, I think that's what it a good comparison would be would be the Tamagotchi. All right. Yeah, very interesting, though. Uh, I thought this was a pretty cool story uh, from NintendoLife.com. Uh, this was a feature they did, games that got us through tough times. Uh, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and while a lot of stigma around the topic has eased, the issues and challenges remain across all parts of society. Throughout this month, there are efforts to encourage support, understanding, and knowledge about the topic. There are various ways to help improve and maintain mental health from basics such as regular exercise and a healthy diet to more complex treatment and support. Yet on a smaller scale, other pleasures can help us deal with some tough times that life throws at us, whether it's a book, movie, or video games. So what were some games that have gotten you, you through some tough times for you? Well, two that I can, I can think of right offhand um, back when... Um, Back when, when my band Fall As Well kind of imploded and the rug was yanked out from under us and then like a week later my grandfather died, that was a really hard time for me. And 
World of Warcraft really helped me through that because I just I just dove into Warcraft very heavily for about three years after that. It's just it just kept me from going crazy, I guess you'd say. So World of War, World of Warcraft was a really big game in helping me get through that harsh time in my life. And the second one I can think of readily was uh, right during my divorce. I, I was I Resident Evil Two the remake hit right then and was like the thing that I just dove into to kind of you know escape from everything for a, even just a little while you know yeah as cliche as my answer is going to sound it's zelda ocarina of time hmm. and i say that for through really two periods uh, in my life one was through middle and high school because that was when my severe social anxieties really kind of started to to develop so it was it was tough for me to really talk with anybody you know, I was very much a loner up until about my sophomore year in high school. And that was middle school was around the time that Ocarina of Time came out. And being a already a huge Zelda fan, it was a game that I could just immerse myself into and not think about you know, anything else. And then that that game came back up again in 2012 uh, when one of my best friends died in a car accident. Hmm. Um, so. It was something that, you know, I didn't want to think about. It was before I really learned to, you know, face your problems head on. Yeah. It was back then I thought, well, if you ignore the problem, yeah. it will just go away. Well, but that's what World of Warcraft did for me. You know, like after, you know, I was 27 years old when everything went down and, I, you know, I had put all my eggs in one basket with that band. And then when everything was pulled out from under me, I had no no direction in life i was i had an unfinished college degree you know my grandfather died and i i was just directionless so i was like you know what i'm just going to play this game and just turn my brain off to the outside world i'm going to live in azeroth for the next 3 years of my life well i think it also shows that you know different things work for different people like yeah like a movie could be your outlet in yeah. our cases, it's been video games. And I, I don't think it necessarily matters what it is as long as you find something that can help you in some form of fashion. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. I, I wouldn't do... If you are facing a tough time and you're looking for an escape, I wouldn't suggest doing what I did and basically turning your life over to a video game. I mean, I would literally go to work like a zombie and work, you know, from seven in the morning till usually three in the afternoon, four in the afternoon, go home, eat dinner, sleep for a couple of hours and then get up and raid with all my friends in world of Warcraft till all night long until I had to go to work. And I did that every day for about three years until I finally decided to get my shit together. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, it took a while, but, and it helped, but I probably would have, it would have been better if I had gone to therapy maybe, <laughs> but you know, I, I cause that's cause I, I don't want to give people the wrong impression. Like if, if something's going wrong in your life, you should seek some sort of help and not, you know, don't escape. internalize it. Yeah, exactly. Don't keep it inside and just don't deal with it by living in a, a virtual world. Yeah. Don't do what we did. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, video games like, are look, great for, for good stress relief, uh, unless you're like me and you, you get angry and want to throw your controller through the TV. But, you know, that's that's neither here nor there. <laughs> they they can be they can be a great help. But I, I totally agree with you that, you know, I I went through therapy a few years ago and it helped me immensely and it helped me realize, you know, there's more like you, you shouldn't internalize yeah. your problems because that doesn't solve them. Therapy's great, but mm -hmm. it, it, I would suggest don't go, you know, don't just go with the first, like if you're seeking help, don't just go with the first therapist you come across. It's going to take a, a little while to find a therapist that really works well with what you're going through. And when you find that person, you'll know. Yeah. And if like you're it's, going, it's, 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 
Uh, Go ahead. If you are going to a therapist and you find that you, you you're not getting what you need, it, don't be afraid to say, "Hey, I don't I don't think this is working. Can we, you know, talk to the insurance company or talk to the the therapy place and be like, can I maybe get with someone else?" And if they're a good therapist, they will understand yeah. that and all and even recommend somebody else. Exactly. Yeah, they'll be happy to recommend. They may even say it themselves. You know, being a therapist, they may be the first one to say, "I don't think this is going to work, but I have someone else that you know will help be a mm-hmm. bit be, be a better fit." So don't be afraid. You know, like therapy's not scary. It was scary to me at first, but once you get into it, it's pretty cool. You'll be surprised at how relieved and honestly empowered you feel once you do it. Oh yeah. But uh, but we got a little bit of video game history to do. We got some uh, got some game stuff here to talk about. You want to jump into history? Let's do it. On May twenty fourth, nineteen seventy two, Magnavox unveils the Magnavox Odyssey, the first video game console at a Burlingame, California convention. Nutting Associates, oh, that's a horrible name, manufacturer <laughs> of computer space since Nolan Bushnell, who we all know is the fa- father of uh, Atari and Chuck E. Cheese, uh, to mm-hmm. observe the launch. Bushnell reports back that he found the device underwhelming and expresses no concern over the competition. That's, uh, that's a pretty powerful statement, but that would actually be a very good trivia question. What is the first video game console yeah it is not the nes or the atari it's the magnavox odyssey i see i see odyssey games all over the place for the magnavox odyssey but i've never had one i don't even think i've ever seen one in real life no i know for a fact that i haven't and how ironic is it that the city it was unveiled at was burling game yeah (laughs) that's you can't write that May 13th of 1976, Atari releases Breakout, whose prototype was designed by Apple Computer co-founders Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak to video arcades. I love me some Breakout. Breakout's a great game. I I know of it, but I've never played it. It's the game, you know, you've seen, you've seen at least gameplay of it before, haven't you? I believe so. It's where you got the little, little thing that, like, the little at the bottom of the screen and you're you're bouncing the ball. Oh yeah, I know this game. Breaking the bricks at the very top and you're trying to get rid of all the bricks. It's a Yeah, f- it's a great ironically time waster. Ironically enough, there's a boss fight in uh Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island that has almost like the floor has the same kind of layouts with the different colored bricks and you have mm. to actually break them using eggs to to sink the the boss in lava. I wonder if that was the inspiration behind that. Oh, I'm sure. It was from Breakout. Yeah, because Breakout, like, there was a lot of Breakout clones after that, after that yeah. game came out. Uh, May 27th of 1986, Enix releases Dragon Quest for the Famicom, which is usually considered the foremost Japanese role-playing video game and the, is the first game in a series that has been phenomenally successful in Japan, which, uh, if you don't know what Dragon Quest is, it is known as... Uh, is it Dragon, Dragon Warrior? Dragon Warrior in America, which I got my free copy of when I resubbed to uh, Nintendo Power, I think in 1989, 90, somewhere around there. Have we reviewed a Dragon Warrior game? We have not. I keep saying I'm going to, but I never have. It's funny because we're almost 300 episodes in, but there's still <laughs> a ton of games that. Like we haven't like there's franchises that we haven't yeah. even touched yet. And Dragon Quest is still going on. I mean, they just released what Dragon Quest Ten just a few years ago. Yes, yeah, something like that. So we need to go back and read and review Dragon Quest. We I think I think that's a Dragon or Dragon Warrior. I mean, that's that's a must. I think we have really done a disservice by not reviewing that game. Yeah, we've got to review it at some point this year. Let's see. Uh, May 1st of 1996, the GameSpot website is launched. This was a website along with GameFAQs that I frequented <laughs> when the uh, when the Internet first really like became oh, big yeah. and I got my first computer. This was a site that I, I looked at with this IGN GameFAQs every day 
when I would get home from school, these would be some of the first websites that I would go to. Yeah, GameSpot was definitely in the uh, the bookmarks page. I used to go to GameSpot all the time. Let's see, that was 96, so that's, this will be 26 years? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, May 10th of 1999, Super Mario Brothers Deluxe is released with the Game Boy Color in North America and Europe. Yep, I remember Super Mario Brothers Deluxe very well. It was a, um, the cool thing about it, so it's the original Mario Brothers game mm -hmm. that was originally released for the NES, but you also had a, an overworld map that you would be on, like whenever you'd complete 1 1. You'd go to the map and you'd see Mario move to like a cave level. Oh, that's cool. You would select cool. it and then do one dash two. It also had some features with the Game Boy printer, which I never had, but some of those games had like I'm trying to like you could get certain like stickers or printouts that you could do for specific games, but I never really dabbled into like that aspect of the the Game Boy very much. But I liked playing Super Mario Brothers Deluxe a lot. Yeah, I never played it. And last but not least, May 1st of 2002, Bethesda releases the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind for Windows. I didn't get into Elder Scrolls until near the end of Oblivion's run, not too long before Skyrim came out. But, yeah. I mean, you, you think of just, like, longevity. We were talking about Dragon Quest or Dragon Warrior. Elder Scrolls has got to be up there, too, as far oh, as yeah. just long-standing franchises. I never got into the Elder Scrolls until I tried out Oblivion, I think, for the 360 and played it for a little while, but never really got that into it. But man, when Skyrim came out, I think I got it when it launched in 2010 for the 360. God, I put about 200 and something hours into that game. Actually, to the point where I sold the game to a friend from work. Cause I was like, you got to get this thing away from me. I can't <laughs> spend any more time in here. No, I totally know what you mean. I, me and several friends of mine went to the midnight launch of Skyrim. We went to a, one of our friends' house. We each had our own console and TV, and we were spread all throughout the house, and we stayed up all night playing Skyrim, that game, like up until 8 or 9 in the morning. That game has been so successful that they've released like 10 different versions of it over the last 12 years. Yeah, they released it on the Switch, you know, years, <laughs> like eight to nine years after it was initially released. Crazy. Like, when we were and kids, it, like, no games lasted eight years. Like, there's no way. Nope. I still remember fighting my first dragon in Skyrim, yeah. and it freaked me out because I'm just like, <laughs> oh, my God, it's a dragon. So good. That game was so good. Yeah, that... I've never played any of the other Elder Scrolls games. Like uh, my friend Trevor, I mentioned earlier, he was a huge fan of Oblivion. So I watched him play it, and that's what got me wanting Skyrim. Yeah. Like I said, I played Oblivion a little bit, but di it didn't capture me like Skyrim did. Skyrim just had some kind of secret sauce with it that just sucks you in and you can't get out. I would love to play it again, but cool. I, I just... <laughs> That's dangerous. I don't have the time for that anymore. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, before we go into the review for tonight, Derek has, of course, our Patreon shout-outs. As always, we'd like to shout-out our awesome patrons over at patreon.com slash nerdcaveretro. Excuse me, we want to shout-out Daniel Salmon, Tyler Watson, Axeblade07, Armez Jackson, Hand Solo, Carlos Longoria, a.k.a. Rampage, Rampage. Staff Sergeant Sketch, Gus and Penny, Matthew Salmon, Mike Eveland, happy belated birthday to Mr. B. Oh, yeah, Rez Coffee himself, and Mr. Brandon Rutledge. Thank you all so much for your continued contributions to the show. And if you want to become a patron, you get early access to our amazing commentary tracks. I listened to the Ewoks commentary <laughs> the other day, and I, I could feel the pain from you and Wally coming through the the speakers I in was, my car. I listened back to it the other day when it when it dropped on the regular feed because I had forgotten what we talked about during it. Because I remember I was like, we stopped talking about the show like halfway through, 
And then at one point I, I was listening and I was, I just said, Oh my God, we still have 10 minutes left. And I just immediately went back to that point. I was like, Oh my God, that show felt like it was never end. So if you want to hear fun commentary tracks like that, we've also done other great movies and shows as well, like gargoyles, Batman, the animated series, the X-Men animated series, movies like clue, uh, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, Super Mario Brothers. We've got a ton of awesome commentary tracks, and I, we're going to be putting up a poll for this month, right? Yeah, I was supposed to do it last week, and I forgot. <laughs> so so be on the lookout me. for a, be on <laughs> the lookout for a poll for uh, May's commentary tracks. So if you want to be a part of that, just head over to patreon.com slash nerdcaveretro. And for new patrons, send us your social media info, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, email, so we can give you a proper shout out. And tonight, Derek is going to be talking about. It's pretty sweet music for this game. Oh, I love the music to this game. It's one of my favorite aspects of it. So this is a game that I've been wanting to review now for, I believe, the last month or so, ever since I was really introduced to it, because I didn't play it growing up. But the game that I'm going to be talking about is Gunstar Heroes, which was originally released for the Sega Genesis. Um, and also, funny enough, uh, we were talking about the 3DS last week i had some extra money that i had not used and i found that it on the 3ds so i'm like oh. you know what i haven't played my 3ds in a while so bought it and i've been playing it uh on that but it was uh, gunstar heroes is a running gun shooter video game developed by treasure and published by sega uh, released on the sega genesis in 1993 hmm. interesting thing about treasure so it was a uh, a smaller company that was made up of ex Konami employees who had become kind of disgruntled at mm. Konami because they wanted to make original games and not just, you know, new Ninja Turtles or Castlevania games like Konami was kind of starting to do with just releasing sequels and whatnot. So they had the idea for this game. They left and founded their own company and made it for the Sega Genesis. That's so I thought cool. that was actually really cool. I didn't know this was ported to the the, uh, the 3DS and the Game Boy Advance. I mm -hmm. thought this was strictly a uh, Sega property. It was also on the uh, the Wii, not the Wii U, but the Wii um, eShop back in the day. Because I do remember seeing it. Because that was, you know, not too long after Sega had decided we're just going to make games for other consoles. So you started seeing. Sega content with Nintendo, which is still a little weird to me because I grew up in the 90s and knew they hated each other and everything. <laughs> so anyway, we, we've been talking about beat-em-ups quite a bit, but we haven't really talked too much about running guns, which are kind of the same thing, except you have guns instead of, you know, your fist or weapons like the Ninja Turtles have. Um, it plays similar to Contra, if you've played Contra before, it, it plays very similarly to that. Um, it's a side scroller. It can be played in single player or you can do a co-op mode, which looking back on it, I kind of wish that I had somebody to play it with because if I could sum up this game in one word, it's chaos. <laughs> Even I playing it on like normal mode. So I'm like, it has four difficulties. It has easy, normal, hard and expert hmm. so i'm like i'll do normal i mean it can't <laughs> be that bad so the what you do is you you go through these different stages and the cool thing is you have a selection of four that you can go through at the first portion of the game you could go through them in any order you want which i thought was really cool um there's seven stages total but there's like a like a halfway point to the game where you then have to go through certain stages in order in order to reach the final boss so the first level i went through was like a minecart level kind of similar to the one in donkey kong country 
Yeah. So you you start out, you you get right in this mine cart, and all of a sudden these enemies just swarm the screen like mosquitoes or flies, and I'm just like, oh my god! Like I had, I was almost overwhelmed by it, but because I, I hadn't played a running gun in so long that I'm like, yeah, this is what it's supposed to be like. <laughs> so it's it's chaotic in a very fun way, because the cool thing about being able to use guns is you have different upgrades that you can do. And you also can choose from four different uh, types of gunshots that you have. Um, you can have a homing shot, which is pretty self-explanatory. You shoot a beam and it travels to wherever the closest enemy is and wipes it out. You also have a uh, lightning, which is more for your long range kind of attack. Um, you have a machine gun, pretty standard weapon my personal favorite is the flamethrower it's very powerful but the drawback to it is that you have to be in close proximity like it's a close yeah. combat kind of weapon but you can get upgrades in each level and upgrade your gun and you can combine types so say if you have if you start out with a flamethrower and you find a, a flame emblem you can pick that up and it just you have the same weapon, but it's just twice as powerful. Yeah. Or if you find the homing shot, you can combine it with the flamethrower <laughs> and you'll shoot a single fireball that will fly around the screen <laughs> and wipe out all the enemies that are on it. So it, it was really cool in that sense of, you know, figuring out all the different combination types and what works best. My personal favorite is the the homing fireball just because one, it looks cool and it's just to me, it's the most powerful weapon in the game. So uh, I think I oh, did go ahead. play this a little bit on the Genesis Mini and um, I don't think I've played it for very long though. But it looks great. Like I'm looking at some of the video and some of the screenshots from this game. Like this is a great looking game. Like it looks like something Konami would have made. Well, and they wanted to make it on the Genesis specifically because the processor was a little bit better than the Super Nintendo. So yeah. I don't know if the game would have flowed quite as smoothly if it had been for the Super Nintendo. And there's a lot to like about this game. It has a very bright and vibrant look. And the the version I played was, you could call it remastered for the 3DS. It was converted to 3D, but... I never play the games in 3D on 3DS, but um, the graphics look great. They still hold up. I mean, we've talked ad nauseum about that style of graphics and that it's, they're timeless. Um, the music is phenomenal. It fits perfectly, I think, with the game. You just it, it helps immerse you in this world that has been created. I'm trying to see what the... Sorry, my computer's not really said cooperating two of the, here. But... Two of the programmers, Mit Mitsuru Yaida and Hideyuki Sug Suganami, previously programmed Contra 3, The Alien Wars. And holy mm -hmm. crap, that game is hard. Uh, that's something about this game, too, is that it's, it's not easy. Like, on normal, it feels like I'm playing on hard. Because you just get so overwhelmed and you have to do go through multiple boss fights in each stage. Like each stage has at least two bosses. So you'll have like a mini boss that you fight at like the halfway point. Then you have a bigger one that you fight at the end. And in that minecart level that I mentioned, there are, I think, three bosses that you have to fight in succession. So does this game have any kind of a save feature or um any kind of like how many continues do you, do you get unlimited you, continues you get unlimited continues um there's not any save feature that i'm aware of which is unfortunate because i had to leave my 3ds on and just hook it up to the the ac adapter so i wouldn't lose my progress because i i tried really hard to beat this game which is where I want to go with my rage quit story that I was telling you about <laughs> earlier. So there's this, the fourth world, if you go through the levels in order, there's a world called the Dice Palace where you go in this giant room and in the background, it looks like, the wall looks like a board game. 
and there's a single die that's laying in the middle of the room and you have to roll it and you move your character depending on the number that the die lands on. Okay. De- depending on what spot you land on, you have to do different objectives. Usually it's some kind of small boss fight, but you might get lucky and you get transported to this room where you can get upgrades for your gun, um, extra health, things like that. But the spot before you get to the end, if you land on it, it takes you all the way back to the beginning of the of the the puzzle. So where do I land? Why would you do that? <laughs> I land, and I knew it was going to happen. But I just rolled the dice. And I'm like, yeah, I, I was four spots away from the end. And I'm like, I'm going to roll a three. I've been to the casino enough to know how my luck is going to go with this kind of thing. <laughs> So I land on a three. Not only does it take me back to the beginning of the board game, it resets the board. Oh. So then I have to go through it again. And I how, have how like. How long did it take to get, get from the beginning of that to, to where you like? How long did that? Like, how long before did it t- set you back? About how long? Uh, probably like 20. Th- 20 or 25 minutes. Oh, God. That makes me hurt thinking about it. Oh, but it gets better, my friend. <laughs> so I have like 40 to 50 something health. So it, with your health, you start out at like 100 points and mm-hmm. it, it goes down, you know, the more you get hit. So I'm down to like 40, 45. I make it to the end. I get to the boss. And I'm playing very smart because I'm like, if I die, I'm going to have to go back to the beginning. I get the boss down to about 200 health and he hits me. And then I get taken back to the beginning of the the board game and the board's fully reset. I threw my 3DS across the couch. (laughs) (laughs) And I haven't played it since. It just goes to prove that these programmers back in the eighties and nineties, they're they, evil. They hated children. I'm telling yes. you that being said, I really like the game. Like I, 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 I like the gameplay. I like the, you know, we were talking about beat em ups last week in the sense that you have to have a little bit of luck on your side mm-hmm. because a lot of it is just button mashing. It's the same thing with a running gun. You have to be, I think a little bit smarter with a running gun than you do with beat em ups, but it's still just so much fun to just go through these levels and just wipe out as many little robots as you can. But there, to put something like that in the game, I mean, it's bad enough to hit a glitch in a game and have to go back, you know, 25, 30 minutes and redo a bunch of stuff. There's nothing I hate worse than having to go back and redo stuff. I can understand if I hit a glitch or something because they can't catch everything. You know, sometimes stuff is going to slip through the cracks. But when they intentionally put something in the game that puts me back more than 10 minutes worth of stuff I have to do again, that's game-breaking to me. Like, that's egregious. And I could be wrong in saying this, but in that in the Dice Palace, I don't know if you can roll higher than a three. Because I never did. <laughs> so it's like... The concept is cool, but mm. you guys are evil. I don't. That makes me not want to play this game. Other than that, like I, <laughs> I like the concept of it. Like it's still kind of mind blowing that that was in the game because I was not expecting it at all. Like you just go in this in this room and all of a sudden I see a board game and I'm like, oh, this is new. Yeah. And I and initially I thought it was kind of cool until I landed on that spot that takes you all the way back to the beginning and resets the board and i'm like i don't like this anymore yeah this this is this is not fun i had a glitch in a game that i'm playing for a future review here on the show and it's something everybody's going to be quite surprised when i finally review it and uh i hit a glitch about two hours into the game that literally sent me all the way back to the very first save of the game, which is about 11 minutes into the game. Because I kept every save... And I'm one of these people. I don't trust autosave. 
if I hit a save spot, if there if it's a game where you have to be in a specific spot to save, I'm going to save multiple times to make sure that I don't have what happened to me happen. Yeah. And so I'm saving at every point in the game for two hours. It was my first time playing the game. And I saved, got to about two hours into the game, saved. All right, I'm going to come back tomorrow. Came back the next day, loaded up my save, and where was I? I was at the very first save point that I hit in the game that was only 11 minutes into the game. And I was like, you have got to be effing crapping me (laughs) i'm trying not to go rated r here yeah and i was almost to the point where i was like i'm not gonna do it i'm not gonna redo all this stuff again like this two hours two hours worth of stuff i have to go back and redo but i did it i gritted my teeth and i did it and now I, I, i had another glitch not too long ago but we'll talk about that when i actually review the game that's going to be a must see and must listen episode, <laughs> but that I'm going to make popcorn. That was one of the worst things I've ever had happen to me in the game to get two hours into a game and every save you've done is not there. Like what happened? That happened to me with uh, earthbound beginnings. Cause I wanted to review that, you know, sometime this month and I gotten about an hour into the game and then I turn my switch on and my save file is gone. Ugh. Oh, I was I was livid. <laughs> I was not, absolutely livid. Nothing worse than when your save files get corrupted. Yeah. It's the worst. Yeah. But I haven't mentioned really anything about the story of of Gunstar Heroes. So the North American version is different than the Japanese one. So in the North American version. Um, you play as a member of the Gunstar Dynasty, uh, which has been the protector of the planet Gunstar 9 for generations. Uh, in his youth, Professor White Gunstar defeated Gold and Silver, a destructive android that traveled millions of miles to suck G9 dry of all its resources. Uh, Professor White was able to extract the four famous mystical gems, the robot's power source, and imprisoned it on one of G9's moons. Uh, Colonel Red, a new menace, uh, found out that the Gunstars knew the location of the gems and kidnap the Gunstar twins' older brother, Green, and use a mind control device to make Green obey his orders. So you play as one of the Gunstar twins to you know, try and rescue Green. If you do two-player, then you play as both of them. Hmm. I would love to play through this game again with in co-op mode because I feel like as fun as the game was, I think it's truly meant to be a two-player game. I don't know if that would up the difficulty of it or if there would be more enemies on the screen. That's what I was just about to ask. But, if there's a second player, does it ramp up the difficulty? Yeah, that I'm not sure about that. I would be very interested in finding out. But uh, all in all, you know, minus the uh, the frustrating aspect of the, the Dice Palace, hmm. I actually really enjoyed playing this game a lot. I think the universe is cool. I love the music. I love the graphics. It's a pretty easy game to pick up. I mean, you literally just shoot things. There's not a ton of strategy involved. When you get to boss fights, you have to be a little bit more strategic and cerebral in what you do. But when you're getting up to that point, you just shoot things. Yeah. And and the fact that you have all these different combinations of weapons that you can do. You can combine, you know, the machine gun and the lightning gun. You can combine the flamethrower and the lightning gun. You just, there's so much, there's so many options that make this game fun. And it makes you think, okay, well now I want to try this combination and see if that helps and figuring out what works best for you is really a, a fun, a fun part of this game. I, I really, really liked it. Why and, is bad uh, guys st- big bad guys stealing gems always like a big trope in sci-fi and fantasy? Even like yeah. back in the 90s, almost every game was some bad guy stealing gems. Then we get in the two th- t- 2000s and we have you know the Marvel movies where they're all about a bad guy stealing gems. That damn Thanos. <laughs> 
But uh, Gunstar Heroes achieved greater recognition than the company Treasure even anticipated. Uh, EGM called it their game of the month and the game placed first and beat Mega Drive's reader rankings in Japan. And GameFan went so far as to deem it their game of the year in 1993. So pretty, pretty high praise. Electronic Gaming Monthly gave it 36 out of 40. Uh, Famitsu gave it 29 out of 40. Game Informer, uh, 9.25 out of 10. And Sega Magazine, uh, 94 out of 100. So it it gained some pretty high praise. And yeah. I, I don't, which is funny because I don't really remember hearing about it growing up. Me neither. GamePro called it an assault on your senses. <laughs> I would say that's accurate because it's, you almost get a little bit of sensory overload. Yeah. If you don't know what you can expect going in with just the sheer amount of enemies that are going to attack you. Yeah. I just never, I didn't really, I only knew like one person that had a Genesis when I was a kid. And the only games he had were the Sonic games and um, I forgot what else he had. I'd go to his house for, you know, for a sleepover or whatever. We play a lot of Sonic stuff like that, but I didn't know anybody else with a Genesis, so like a lot of these games, I'd never even heard of uh, until I got the Genesis Mini, and I'm like, "Ooh, what's this? What's this?" And when I first got it, I would just go through, play a couple minutes of each game to just try to, you know, get a feel for them. And that's what I mm-hmm. love about the Genesis Mini. Like, if you never got to experience a Genesis back in the day, or even if you had a Genesis, like that Genesis Mini, that thing is great and worth every penny. I think I like it a little more than the mini Nintendos. And there's no bad games on it. Mm-mm. It's great. No, there's really not. But yeah, my my knowledge of the Genesis was fairly limited as well. Like I knew of Sonic and I knew of Vector Man and I think Altered Beast were the only Genesis games that I yeah. really knew of. Well, but. I remember the the advertisements for things like Vector Man and Sonic and all that kind of stuff. Like that stuff would just be all over comic books and stuff. And plus, you know, the Electronic Gaming Monthly, which I used to read back then. Um, But of course, you know, I was such a Nintendo nerd (laughs) with Nintendo Power, like all the time, and just nothing but Nintendo, Nintendo, Nintendo. And I was just like, I I don't want Sega. I I need a Super Nintendo. Nope, I was the the exact same way. But I, despite the the craziness of the board game level it doesn't completely take away from my enjoyment of the game like i do want to go back and get past that point and then eventually beat the game i will go as far as to give this an eight wow it's a very good looking smooth running game yeah i i really i really enjoyed it so i would highly recommend it it's it gets a little crazy but I think it's worth trying if you're a fan of like the beat 'em up run and gun genre. If you like Contra, yeah, I think you'll like Gunstar Heroes. The Contra game for to me, I love Contra. Contra and, and Super C are some of my favorite Nintendo games. But holy crap, the the 16 bit Contra games are they're so hard, and I like I have trouble playing run and gun shooters for the 16 bit era. So this might be a little out of my league because I just don't have the reflexes to, to it, play it, these these games anymore. It's a genre of games that I know I'm not very good at, and it's not my strong suit. Yeah, but I still like playing them. But they're fun because of what they are. Yeah, yeah. If you could play, if I could play, you know, Contra Three Alien Wars or, uh, you know, the si- other 16-bit uh, Contra games, those Alien Wars for. Uh, for the SNES, or was that the? I think it was Sega Super version? Nintendo because it's on the SNES Mini. Okay, and there was another one they made for Sega that was a different Contra game. I don't remember what it was uh, called. Let's but, see. Man, those games are nuts. Like I can barely get past the first level. Rampage in the chat room. Rampage. Rampage. Uh, there was C, the Contra Adventure for That's PlayStation. It. Oh, was there? I thought yeah, it there came was... out in '98. I thought there was a Contra Genesis game, too. Uh, Contra Hardcore. That's it. Hardcore, yep. yeah. It came out in 94. I watched somebody do a speed run of that not too long ago, and it was insane. 
I would highly, I don't remember who did it, but definitely go look up that speed run on uh, YouTube. And it's like, I don't understand how you get that good at a game like that. I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I really couldn't nuts. tell you, but, but I would recommend Gunstar Heroes. I think it was actually a very fun game. And I wanted to thank South 80 for the, uh, the, the follow. Thank you very much. And mm-hmm. I'm glad you're here. And, um, but yeah, I'm going to try this out this weekend. I'm going to fire up the Genesis Mini, play it for a little bit, and uh, let you know what I think about it. Yeah, now I'd love to know what your thoughts are. Because I did play it, like I said, for a little bit. Didn't play it for very long, but uh, but I'll give it a good good shot this weekend and play it for a little bit. But if I get to the end and I get to that, that stupid game board part and <laughs> it sends me back 30 minutes to oh, stuff I got to do again, that's it. That's all you get from me, game. We don't play. I don't, we don't play you. that stuff around here. <laughs> I don't blame you at all. Uh, but awesome! I'm I'm glad you uh, got to play it because I've always been a little curious about it and just never really jumped into it. Yeah, no, I would recommend it. I I'd be very curious to know what your thoughts are because I'm. My initial thought is that you would like it, but the the board game section might might do you in as you far know, as your opinion on it. You know my temper. <laughs> uh next week i actually got a copy of i went to the flea market last weekend and picked up iron sword wizards and warriors 2 which uh, i did a review of wizards and warriors for the last episode and for this next one i'm gonna review the sequel and i'm very excited because it's got fabio on the cover and it's gonna be like a romance novel come to life (laughs) i'll get a blonde wig oh uh somebody uh, asked us in the chat room. Uh, Dorflam asked, "You guys got thoughts on new Trek? Sorry, just tuned in, so no idea if that's your thing." I have been watching the new Star Trek: um, Strange New Worlds, and I am really, really liking it. I was not Me too. a huge fan. I watched the first season of um, uh, what was the Discovery? Discovery, and I liked the first season, but I kind of fell off in the second season. It went a little too haywire for me. I watched the first six episodes or so of Picard and fell fell off. It's just, I I need to get back to it. It just wasn't capturing my attention. But man, this new Trek is, it's some Star Trek-ass Star Trek. Which is not a bad thing. Now, I, so I'm not a giant Star Trek fan. I don't dislike it. I, I like the next generation, but I've never really been able to get into any other Star Trek property. I was like you when, you know, the first season of Picard initially came out. I wanted to like it, but Mm -hmm. it just it didn't grab my attention. But I eventually powered through it. The second season is is very good. Um, I I like what they're doing with Strange New World so far. It feels so cinematic. And yes, just it feels like Star Trek. It's like villain of the week style Star Star Trek. And that's what I'm I want. I don't want like a season long arc. I mean, you can give me an overarching story, but give me that villain of the week. You know, the new world that they're going to, the new species. And this last episode, and uh, Dorflam also said he liked the first half of episode one. First contact stuff is always great. The second episode is fantastic. With um, It has to deal with them trying to save uh, a planet from uh, uh, a comet that is sentient. And it is really, it's like a little bit alien, a little bit uh, like every kind of sci-fi genre all kind of mashed into one, like a little bit of, what what did Steve say? Our our good friend Steve Wise on Facebook, he said it's a little bit of Close Encounters, a little bit of Alien. You see hints of many sci-fi projects, but it, it all works together to make a cool star trek series it's a great episode so i would go definitely go check that out and uh but yeah i I give it thumbs up so far Uh, it's only two episodes in but i give i definitely give it thumbs up and yes it's off to a great start the singing comet does feel old trek like that's what i love about it like that's some old original star trek type stuff yeah but, uh, but that's going to sure. do it for this week. Is there anything you want to throw out there? I know you, we, we both got stuff coming up in a little bit. So yep. feature presentation. Uh, feature, yep. Back tonight, uh, 8 p.m. Central on YouTube. So just search uh, feature presentation with Derek Diamond and 
Uh, be sure to subscribe. Uh, I'll be chatting with a local filmmaker from right here in Pensacola named Calvo Griffin, who is actually the founder of Gulf Coast Culture Fest that I'll be appearing at this weekend. So I know he's he's been uh, pretty prevalent in the local filmmaking scene here for the last few years. So get to uh, hear his story and uh, learn more about Gulf Coast Culture Fest. It'll be good to to be back i've been ready to bring the show back now for the last few weeks so i wish i could be good there to live, have it back. but i can't i gotta do open micers at 7 30 <laughs> yeah stupid us and putting our stuff on the same night Ah, eh, well yeah when you're done with open micers hop yeah, over I'll, a future I'll hop presentation over. as soon as yeah. we're done i'll hop over. well i'm saying that to the listeners too <laughs> oh, if you're yeah. gonna listen to open micers when you guys are done you can hop on over to my yeah show. head on over um, yeah, we're doing. We moved open micers as well. Like we we flip flop the shows and put them on Monday night. So we've got now we've got this show, Nerd Cave Retro at 6 p.m. Central, and then we're gonna have open micers at 7:30, and then feature presentation at 8 Central. So it's a night full of me and Derek. So if you if you can't get enough me and Derek, Monday night's the night you want to be here on Twitch. So yep. uh, <laughs> that's that's pretty much it. And um, anything else before we get out of here this evening? No, I think that's it. All right, let me play our music here. If you'd like to email us, you can email us at nerdcaveretro at gmail.com. We're at Facebook, facebook.com slash nerdcaveretro. Of course, Instagram and Twitter at nerdcaveretro and individually at jpunktastic and at Derek underscore diamond. Go get us some go get some merch from us at ncrmerch.com. We got all kind of t-shirts, bags, coffee mugs, everything. Everything you need is at ncrmerch.com. Patreon, patreon.com slash nerdcaveretro. Just a little as a dollar a month and you get early access to all those commentary tracks. And of course, don't forget brezcoffeeco.com. Go use our code NCR at checkout for 10% off your order. If you can't do all that, I know money's tight. Times are tough. Go leave us a review wherever fine podcasts are given away for free. So Derek, please tell them what it's all about. May the way of the hero lead to the Triforce. Yes. Master Blaster runs by the town. You blow it! Fantastic. Good stuff. Yeah, thank you guys for hanging out with us. Uh, and the, yeah. And uh, yeah, every Monday now at 6 p.m. we're going to be here. So if you guys want to come hang out with us live, we will be here. And like I said, next week we're going to be reviewing Iron Sword for the NES, which famously had Fabio on the cover. And I just want to know the statistics of how many... Urban Housewives bought that game in the 80s thinking it was a romance novel. I just still can't believe it's not butter. Yeah, and, and get hit in the face with a duck or whatever happened. Remember that when he was on? Yeah, he was on the uh, the thing. I was in some. What, what was, was that? Roller coaster somewhere, and he got hit in the face with a duck or a seagull or something. Only to Fabio. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, thank you guys for hanging out. I'll be back in about 25 minutes with open micers. And then at eight, Derek will be back with feature presentation. So thank yep. you guys for hanging out. We'll be back in just a little while. <laughs>